Good morning from Freiburg and welcome to this Rock keynote interview session. My name is Stefania Xivia and I'm a social and governance innovation officer at ICLE, the leading global network of cities, regions and towns committed to building a sustainable future. On behalf of the hosting team, I would like I would like to take a moment to thank all of you for your consistent participation and engagement throughout this event. We are thrilled by the numbers and the comments and hope you are enjoying this virtual journey across Europe's most vibrant cities as much as we are. Our next stop is London, where about 10 years ago, I was a student at City University and I had the opportunity to attend a course on cultural regeneration led by our keynote speaker, Lia Gilardi. I remember being captivated by her passion, her creative thinking, her sarcasm and unconventional approach to cultural planning. I am sure you can all think of that one teacher who, whose words still resonate in your professional life until this day. Well, for me, this person was Lia Gilardi. I am therefore particularly honored and delighted to welcome her to the stage of the Rock of Knowledge Week for this keynote interview. Mrs. Gilardi, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everybody. Delighted to be here. And after such an introduction, I, I hope I can, I can stand up and keep up with this. Well, I will have to continue, Ms. Gilardi, for those who are meeting you for the first time. So, who is Lia Gilardi? Um, a creative polymath, an urban sociologist by formation. She is internationally recognized as a leader in the delivery of sustainable culture-based regeneration plans and visitor strategies in contexts ranging from large cities to small rural areas. She works mostly with civic leaders, city networks, civic societies, housing developers, and cultural organizations to provide creative and integrated solutions to the challenges of making spaces, places more cohesive, more equitable, and livable for everyone. In the UK, she has um, served for three years as a member of the Mayor of London's Advisory Group on Culture and Development. She is also a member of the Academy of Urbanism, a network of influential thinkers and professionals, decision makers also passionate about a better living for people in towns and cities. She is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, a research organization which encourages the development of a principled, prosperous society and the release of human potential and creativity. So, Ms. Gilardi, you chose a quote by Patrick Geddes as our conversation starter. A city is more than a place in space, it is a drama in time. Indeed, um, we live in times of transformation and our drama is shaped by abrupt events such as the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. Who are the actors of this drama in time and how are their roles changing? Well, I think uh, that quote by Patrick Geddes, it, it, well, it was very inspirational for me um, whenever I came across Patrick Geddes in general. Anyway, he was a biologist, uh, but he was also a planner, um, a historian of cities, so and a futurologist in a way. What he meant by that, he meant that cities are made of, by human beings, are made by the people who live there. So for me, the actors in principally are the people who live in a city, their habits, their routines, their histories, their cultures, their intermingling of, of rituals and lives and social networks, etc. They are the actors principally. But uh, in, in times as we're going through now, uh, we, in a sense, we have seen progressive changes in, in this balance. What, what Geddes hinted at is cities are made of hardware, and software. So we cannot just think of cities as transport, housing, buildings, etc. But we have to think of cities are the at, at the most important part that makes them be is the, is the software, is the people. So what happened in my view for what as an observer of cities in the past 10 or 20 years even, 
there has been a, a slow erosion of this kind of people-centered approach to cities. And the pandemic has highlighted all these issues. Um, the approach was of a sort of neoliberal city making, which meant that growth and, and an understanding of growth in cities was mainly based on short-termism, profit, and not so much of long-term human growth. And I think that was a problem back then, and it's become a bigger problem now after COVID, and, and, uh, and COVID-19 has highlighted these challenges. For example, if we think of what happened during the first lockdown, I'm talking about the first lockdown because we are about to go into a second, as you know, unfortunately. During the first lockdown, teleworking became very popular. Governments were asking people to stay at home, and work from home. But then again, what that revealed, that it's only people who could, who were allowed, who had the means to work from home. The rest of the community or half of communities had not that kind of privilege in a way. And they were those that were more at risk of catching the virus. So already we see here a problematic division in society which is then amplified in many other ways, which we will talk about uh, uh, in, in a minute. So, yes, mm -hmm. the actors, the principal actors are the citizens, the software of the city, etc. But then we have also the institutions that support the growth of this software. And I think cultural institutions and educational institutions are that kind of route for growth human growth and i think in times of post pandemic or in these times that we're going through now there is a task for these institutions which is to rethink their role yeah there is this um, chinese proverb that all things are difficult before they are easy you seem to suggest that besides all the suffering and loss the pandemic is also offering us a chance to make those changes that our societies and our institutions need for us in the rock project and for practitioners and policymakers working in the cultural sector the question of access has been at the top of the agenda for some time now and we are already seeing how we have seen, I mean, in these days, how different rock cities are trying to enhance accessibility to cultural heritage. Tomorrow morning, actually, we're hosting a dedicated seminar on the issue on, of accessibility. So I take this chance to ask, what is, what is your view on accessibility in these, in these troubled times? Yes, I think accessibility is, is a big word, which we have used uh, uh, all the time. I, I mean, if we go back and revisit the notion of the creative city, for example, or uh, the kind of um, cultural policies uh, in the post 1980s uh, times, uh, and, and there, is, there is certainly the question of the social impact of culture, how do we measure that? How do we ensure more communities or different different sectors sectors of the local communities can access cultural services, cultural products, etc. Now that has been, in my view, I think one aspect of a certain kind of policy that is of a certain time. Um, I think today the notion of bringing culture with the capital C to the people is it's not obsolete but i think at least is in need of a review of a rethinking if we stop for a second and, and 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 think what is culture for us now what is culture for you and me now hmm. i mean for me culture could be going to do a pilates class or a yoga class locally or accessing or streaming uh, a, a a a french series on netflix or something in mm. French so that I can practice my French. Um, yep. Or it could be uh, uh, watching uh, Italian TV, Un Posto al Sole, the soap opera, which I love. And, and I really, really love and uh, watching it whenever I can. So I try in, in, when I'm in different countries to tune into or I try and to watch that. 
But then at home, I might listen to Radio 4 or Radio 3, classical music, and so on. So what is then culture here? Can we still refer to culture with Doug Bixie? And can we still refer to access in the way that we perceived it and understood, maybe even in the institutions of the 19th century, on the, on the kind of grand narrative of civilizing, the notion of culture civilizing everybody. And therefore, if only we could bring it to everybody, we would have a better society. So I have a feeling that we, that, that notion of access needs to be reconsidered in view of societal changes, as we said, fragmented identities, uh, um, different uh, kinds of affiliations, sexual orientations, etc. So how do we serve that kind of audience, which is so diverse? And for example, when we talk about heritage, for example, what heritage, for whom? I mean, I was reading during the summer a fantastic book uh, by Roland uh, Rima and uh, other Estonian architects, etc. He talks about monuments in there. Mm -hmm. And he says, monuments are perceived today as a provocation. And he says one sentence which is really interesting, eternity, which we think heritage is eternal. We hand it down from you know, uh, generation to generation. So mm. eternity provokes. We have seen the status war in the UK and in other countries. We are about to change the name of many streets just in the neighborhood where I live yeah. uh, for a variety of reasons. So the question of access then has to be, in my view, reconsidered. We're talking about a contested territory, as you tend to say also. So yeah. indeed, um, a, a, a realm that is open to infinite interpretation. Um, it for surely um, it poses serious policy implications also as it radically changes traditional top-down approaches to the democratization of culture, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think in my view, you know, if you if you want to simplify things and say access uh, one zero one zero access two zero uh, policy for access three zero, let's say we're let's assume we are now in access policy is three zero, then they have to be about cultural democracy. They have to be about organizations, institutions understanding the new role they can perform. So not democratization of culture, but, but cultural democracy. The aim, uh, in a way, has to be yeah. for cultural institutions and organizations to become the mediators in this hybrid society, in this mm -hmm. society made of different identities. So I see a big role for cultural institutions and cultural organizations and culture in general to become really the the interpreter of all these identities without necessarily having a value judgment on any of these identities i know it's difficult and it's complicated because i have been on the side of doing policies for this but if we enter into this mindset of questioning if we are doing an exhibition why are we doing that exhibition for whom who is that person? Who is that painter? And um, what are the exhibits in there that, that we want to show? And what do they mean? Can we do something else instead? Can we co-create with the local community um, a museum or ways in which the local community feel more engaged with their local museum or art gallery or, or institutions in general? Yeah, it seems that co-creation uh, is becoming a key word here and uh, also during the lockdown and despite the difficulties in actually coming together to co-create um, cultural events or other performances, yeah. the actual co-creation process continued online, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we've, we've all seen many excellent examples of organizations trying to rethink how to engage the uh, citizens, how to provide access. I was wondering if you could give us an example, uh, something that caught your attention of how a cultural organization, instead of 
you know, presenting a cu cultural mm -hmm. content is actually mediating in order to facilitate this co-creation process. Yes, I mean, it, it's always a little bit invidious to give examples because then other organizations feel, oh, I've, I've done much better than that. But it, this is something that inspired me to think in mm -hmm. terms of, well, here is an example, the kind of the Berlin Museum of European Cultures. Mm -hmm. which it's recently opened, I mean, two or three years ago, if I if I remember correctly. They also, during the lockdown and, and still now to a certain extent, they created a hashtag, for example, collecting corona, which mm -hmm. doesn't mean they collect the virus, but they collect <laughs> the memories of corona. Uh, right. They collect the memories people send in. And uh, I think I'm just looking at, at, at the, the, the site here. And they ask questions like, what's on your mind? How has your everyday life changed? What worries do you have? Send us a photo or a short video mm. and your text in any language, they say, with your thoughts. And then all photos and videos, etc., will then become part of the collection. And I think that's, that's the co-creation we are talking about. And, and, and it's not just a buzzword because co-creation can become easily a buzzword. And I have seen it happen in, the, in urban development among uh, work I do with architects, etc. But here is a tangible way. And, and so there are many cities uh, yeah. trying to do that right now. And Nantes, I remember reading recently, the city of Nantes has created an archive of memories, etc. And these are archive of pictures, memories, videos that people take on the internet and they talk to the camera and they say, this has happened to me, etc. Et they will all keep all that and they will all become part of the history of yeah. the city. So we're also observing a, a shift in the understanding of what curation means. I mean, the organizational flows within a museum change completely when the content is being produced externally and then, uh, you know, gathered in uh, innumerable, innumerable maybe quantities that nobody can predict, right? So there's a big, a, there's a big surprise element, uh, which I think has all has caught our attention in many, many such uh, co-creative uh, digital projects. Um, I think that we've seen since the first uh, lockdown more and more cultural institutions providing free and equal access to digital platforms, uh, but also academic institutions, um, educational organizations. What is your reflection on, on, on the social trends behind these, uh, these uh, spread of digital content? Well, the spread of digital content is interesting because we knew it. It was happening already when 10 years ago uh, we were doing policies to support clusters in cities or creative industries, clusters, etc. We do understand that the minute technology is available for people to use, then people will create. They will want to create their own products. They will want to create their own cultural uh, products, etc. So we understand that's happening, but in the absence of platforms for this co-creation, let's assume you know we have uh, a scenario in which a country like Estonia, for example, says back in 1997, um, broadband is a human right. We'll give broadband for free to everybody. So. Right. If you have a situation like that, then you have a base on which you can say we can educate our people through that, you know, whether it's physically or not. And during the lockdown, look at it, how Estonia moved immediately all their education um, work online. And so did Finland to a certain extent as well. So there is some ways in which technology can help and can push innovation and, and can certainly cultural production and create new products, etc. But there is a condition, a precondition that I would like to attach to that. And that is something also that uh, Professor Pierluigi Sacco discussed at the very beginning of the lockdown in many webinars. His point was, unless we have national governments and even European governments coming to the table and saying, we need to make 
broadband, we need to make plat digital platforms available to everybody at zero cost or at a very low cost. We need to understand that as a key step in order to build the society, in order to allow cultural institutions and organizations to perform their work that we were talking about earlier in a more uh, in a more coordinated, in a more pragmatic, if you will, but also to disseminate this way of thinking that is, you know, we, we, we have many different lifestyles, many cultures, and we can mediate, and technology can be on our side, can help us on our side. Um, yeah. I, I'm just mindful of the time. We have 10 minutes left. <laughs> so um, I would, we have 10 minutes left maximum so we will um i think i will ask you about the um, the the working class gap i mean the increased the increased class gap that has widened yeah. in this in this process um there is some interesting research from the uk uh that you may want to share with us um to see how exactly this uh, this class uh, class gap is uh, widening in terms of accessing and uh, making benefit of cultural content. So the democratization of culture, as you said, is linked to the access, the, the broadband quality in different territories. Um, and in this sense, um, I think the UK data is uh, is something we need to, that, yeah, we that needs to alarm us. Digital platforms. Because, because that's what we were talking about earlier on. And we were saying the lockdown has precipitated the need for more kind of uh, a variety of digital platforms to be made available to people. So we, we were saying that. And in that way also, we were rethinking the question of access. Mm -hmm. uh, Nesta has done an interesting piece of work, and I give you just two, two bits of, of that research. During the lockdown, they interviewed a sample of people who um, streamed or used uh, cultural content via the internet, and 90% of their sample, which was not big, but significant ne nevertheless in the answers they gave, 90% of them, they said, absolutely, accessing culture has been a lifesaver. Mm. Online has been a lifesaver for them, improved their mood and, and helped them really to stay healthy, etc. However, what they noticed in the, in the Nesta um, survey was that the people who belong to uh, manual work, who do manual work or belong to uh, a, a lower class than the middle class, let's say, um, were, grew more slowly their access to digital platforms, their access to cultural productions or products through digital platforms increased much more slowly than among the middle and upper classes. Mm -hmm. You would say obvious in a way, but that is an indicator of societal challenges that we have. And also, by the way, in terms of institutions, big museums went went online and did virtual tours, etc. But smaller institutions could not afford to do that. So we, we are now left with many smaller institutions who either close down or are not in touch with their audiences at all because they don't have the means to do that. Yeah. So. OK, so to uh, to wrap up uh, slowly, um, going back to this, uh, how this, all these trends that you've de described and all these developments, um, we have seen that also the, the, the pandemic and the lockdown experience is, uh, has shown some new light on urban inequalities, as we said, but also the negative effects of certain approaches to cultural-led regeneration. So how can we uh, avoid for these mistakes to be repeated in the future and um, maybe here as a closing let's say statement you can tell us uh, about this uh, the importance of mapping yeah. and uh, yeah place my yes, mapping yes. in your uh, approach yes i'll i'll i'll, I'll, I'll be as, as as brief as i can and rightly so i don't want to take them from other people um first of all uh, once again go back and revisit the kind of creative city notion that was the notion that was over time and it was necessary. And, and actually we have had, if we look at the history, we have interesting results of policies applied in relation to the creative city, et cetera. So there, is, there are good stories in there, but there is also 
less good stories and in my experience as a cultural planner very often i have politicians that come and say hey we have a problem and, and what is the problem sometimes it's over tourism because they have exaggerated the packaging of their brand and image of the city they got it wrong they didn't think in terms of the cons unintended consequences of having 5,000 people entering all at the same time into a very small city center, which cannot, cannot service all these tourists and so on. So we have this thing, but also we have the fact that smaller places often lost out to the big cities who, which had the preconditions, if you want to implement, implement the creative city. So, but that was in the past. Now we are in, in this situation and in this situation we have to rethink. And I think the first question policymakers and communities need to ask is not anymore the, the original creative city question, which was what do we need to do in order to become creative? Because that, that was the philosophy in a way. Right. Mm -hmm. And then what followed was like a checklist. You do an incubator, you, you have a university, etc. That checklist doesn't work anymore, and there are problems attached to that, and we can't go into the details. But yeah. I think now is the time to maybe shift that kind of thinking into what is already going on in the city right. that could be of interest. That we and could that's the mapping. And the mapping you can uh, only approach. know that what is going on on the ground if the communities themselves take the initiative of undertaking an, a, 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 a self-assessment an, an understanding of what is going on and then bring that material that information to the table of power policy making etc so mm -hmm. it's the Sartre who once said uh you know there are two things in in policy there is the strategies and there is tactics the strategies, in a way, I think belong to the old uh, creative city. We are in the world of tactics today. And tactics beyond belong to the world of down, from down onwards. What is going on on the ground has to be understood. And power in this way is given back to the people to contribute to the policies. So if you tell me, yeah, there is that cluster of young people that are producing that interesting events, etc. Why don't we go and see them? If they need funding, we can then we can then put that particular initiative into our policy for the city, or right. improving public spaces, etc. So I need that notion that power is given back to the to the people who are the important part of the city, as we said at the very beginning is really what is needed now it's more tactics really than than strategies thank you thank you elia gilardi we're running out of time i'm sure many would have uh, kept, would like to stay here and listen to you for a long while um i cannot refer uh, i cannot help but refer to the name of your company noema which means meaning thought perception you surely know how to provide new levels of meaning to all these cultural dynamics and we're thankful uh, for sharing these ideas uh, with the rock community today meaningful connections meaningful conversations is um, what we mostly need these days. So um, I will now give the floor uh, to Pamela Lama, our host. Thank you again, Lia Gilardi. Well, and let's you. see how the rock journey continues for the next yes, day. Good work, guys. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. So Bye. Bye. So thanks, uh, Stefania. And uh, here we have come uh, to the end uh, of the third day of the Rock uh, Open Knowledge Week. But uh, before passing the floor to Christina for an overview of tomorrow's program, I would like to thank today's speakers who brought uh, concrete examples that I hope will be a source uh, of inspiration uh, for all of you. And in particular, I would like to thank uh, once again uh, Lia Gilardi for having offered uh, such uh, good food for thought and keeping uh, the discussion going. And uh, as uh, she was saying, uh, a city is made of hardware and software, where the software is uh, made of the people and uh, their stories and uh, memories. 
And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, during these days, we have kind of uh, recreated an international village with uh, uh, the platform as the hardware and uh, the software made by the people that have uh, populated the platform and animated it uh, with, uh, with stories. So don't forget to use uh, the functionalities of uh, the platform to get uh, in touch uh, both uh, with the speakers and with uh, all the participants to make uh, the platform alive. And I'm also happy to hear that we need tactics. And as we heard before in the presentations given by the University of Bologna, Martina and Rossella, in our uh, integrated uh, management plan, as a matter of fact, we do have identified a series of tactics uh, starting from our experimentation and uh, on the ground uh, observation. So, Cristina, tomorrow it is the last day of this journey across uh, the multifold uh, facets of uh, cultural heritage. It will be a full day of events and uh, surprises, uh, isn't it? Yes, so tomorrow we have really a rich day. We planned uh, three thematic online seminars which bring together academic experts, city representatives and local stakeholders to discuss both theoretical and practical approaches to cultural heritage. And this we will do uh, along the three perspectives that uh, we know about already, accessibility, sustainability, and innovative partnerships, the three rock pillars. We started to discuss about accessibility already um, today uh, with Lia Ghilardi. And these seminars will take place one after the other, so you won't lose any information. The afternoon program will feature two rounds of three parallel open knowledge sessions where our key um, rock outputs and products will be uh, presented and this should help stimulate a kind of dialogue between you and the researchers. At the end of the wow. sessions we will hear 10 minutes of the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven, probably the most admired composer in Western music, on the 250 years anniversary from his birthday, conducted by Michele Mariotti in the Teatro Comunale of Bologna. Despite the current cancellation of many shows, plays and concerts in European cities and theatres and concert halls, despite this really tough year for such cultural events, we have the opportunity to enjoy amazing 10 minutes of music that will conclude our event. And now, uh, for the last uh, 25 minutes, you may join us in the rock and roll networking session. You can meet uh, other conference participants in random one-to-one -one meetups, kind of sport, uh, speed datings. And I personally experienced this myself uh, on Tuesday and it was great fun. So have a look, go back uh, to the lobby and uh, in, join the session. There is a box at the upper right hand a corner of the screen, click on that box and see what or better who is coming up. Each speed date will last five minutes and then a new date begins. So have fun and see you tomorrow at 9.30 for the first thematic online seminar, 9.30 Central European time. Bye-bye. <laughs>